thank you so much for joining us um, for this uh, information session with the JCRC, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington, and the EEOC working in partnership to bring you this webinar on recognizing and responding to anti-Semitism in the workplace. Um, we've been in partnership with the Washington Field Office uh, since earlier this year, probably in the spring was when we first talk, started talking about doing this program. Um, even then in the news, we were all seeing reports of rising anti-Semitism at schools, at universities, um, and, and we weren't hearing quite as much about it in the, um, in the workplace, at least on the news. Um, but yet we know that we were getting complaints um, and uh, and the EEOC was proactive in reaching out to us. Mindy was proactive in reaching out to us to see how she could help um, message to the community um, and be available as a resource. Um, so we put this together well before October 7th. Um, and as I'm sure everybody who's joining us today knows, um, it isn't less relevant today than it was then. Um, and in fact, statistics are showing that anti-Semitism in general, I've seen um, anywhere from 300% to 400% um, has, has, anti-Semitism has increased since last year. Um, those are not workplace numbers, um, they're just general numbers, but, but, uh, but we know that there have to be impacts on the workplace. Um, so thank you for joining us for this, infor for this informative, this, this informational webinar. Um, I hope you will find it helpful. Um, and I want to thank the EEOC and particularly Mindy Weinstein and Commissioner Sonderling for joining us today. Um, let me give you a really brief introduction because I want to save, you can, you can read their, their bios on our, on our um, information, um, and I want to save time for whatever questions people have. Um, but let me just start with Commissioner Keith Sonderling was confirmed by the U.S. Senate with a bipartisan vote um, to be commissioner on the, of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in 2020, um, and his term will go through July 2024. Um, Commissioner Sonderling, he also serves as a professional lecturer, among other things, um, in the law at the George Washington University Law School, teaching employment discrimination. And since joining the EEOC, one of Commissioner Sonderling's highest priorities is ensuring that artificial intelligence and workplace technologies are designed and deployed consistent with longstanding civil rights law. So thank you, Commissioner Sonderling, for being here. Um, Mindy Weinstein is the director of the EEOC's Washington, D.C. field office. Um, where she's responsible for overseeing investigations, mediations, federal sector hearings, and the office's outreach and education program in Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia. She has worked in the Baltimore office, so she can also give us a little bit of perspective um, to cover our whole region. Um, she also previously served as the special assistant to United, United States attorney in Washington, D.C. She's a graduate of Wellesley College and the George Washington University School of Law. Um, and I just want to add that um, it's been a pleasure to work with the office. And I think um, um, Mindy Weinstein brings a lot of um, menschgeleit to the work that she does um, and uh, kindness in the work that she does. So I just want to thank the e Mindy, particularly the EEOC in general, for being a, a really great community partner. So thank you. I'm going to turn it over to the two of you now. Um, and I will share my screen. Uh, tell me when to share my screen. Should I go ahead and start right now? Sure. Okay. Are we starting with a PowerPoint? Sure. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thank you. Well, I want to first thank you all for having me. Um, wish it was under better circumstances. Uh, before uh, joining the government in 2017, I was uh, I lived in Palm Beach County, Florida, and I was very involved um, uh, with the Federation in Palm Beach Council, uh, County. And I also, my first kind of organization within the Federation structure I got involved in was the J... CRC uh, in Palm Beach County um, a while ago. So I, I very much get the the work that you all do within these committees. And I'm really uh, glad you invited us and included us as well. And for Mindy and her team, you know, here locally in the Washington, DC area, you know, they're all, they are on the front lines of having to deal with these issues, all workplace issues as well. So I'm really glad the relationship that has been established um, there too, and, and hope that continues for a long time. So I think we're gonna get started here with the presentation. I think, uh, 
Is what? my screen not being shared? I think you need to go to full screen. I need to go to full screen. Okay, hold on a second. <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing and then we'll see. We'll try that again. <laughs> Hmm. Try going maybe enable editing. Oh, there we go. Okay. And now go to, we see an email. You see an email. I don't want you to see an email. <laughs> now we see all your emails. So I go okay. back to the PowerPoint. All right. All right. Let's see. I, <laughs> I apologize. All right. So I should be clicking on the webinar. Are you seeing the webinar? Okay, now you think you just need to go to full to the. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Uh, Maybe try view. I have somebody coming out to help me now. <laughs> Vicky, you want to try just clicking on slideshow? Kind of in the middle there. Oh, okay. I think I got it. There we go. There go. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> And I think you want to close the the next the next. What am I closing? Go to display settings up there. Yeah. And you just want to show the screen. There we go. Yes. Okay. Did that do it? It did. All right. Thank you. But then, <laughs> Sorry about that. Are you going to move the slides? Yes. Okay. Well, um, now that we got the little technical difficulties behind us, um, thank you all again for coming. So I want to first start and make sure you understand, I know there's a lot of federal government agencies. So the, the EEOC is responsible for enforcing federal laws that make it illegal to discriminate in the workforce, not only against employees, but applicants as well, uh, based on like what I like to call the big ticket items, race, color, religion, sex, um, national origin, age, disability, genetic information. And basically, um, most employers are covered with more than 15 employees. But what's so powerful about our agency and our law, our laws apply to basically all uh, the entire workplace. So a lot of people just think of us related to hiring and firing, but we're much more expansive, really all the terms and conditions of employment, uh, including hiring, firing, promotions, prevents harassment, prevents uh, retaliation. Our laws also apply to training, um, wages, and, and benefits. We are a civil law enforcement agency, so we do investigate, as you'll hear, uh, claims of uh, workplace discrimination, but a big part of our mission is also to prevent employment discrimination before it ever occurs, doing outreach um, like this. So um, let's get started with the, the topic of the day. And uh, unfortunately, that's anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism in the workplace. So I think it's really important to just start taking a step back and saying, you know, what do we mean by anti-Semitism? Is there any kind of accepted definition when it comes to that? And um, there is one, the gold standard, as people like to refer, it, is related to um, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance Associations. Um, they're actual definition of anti-Semitism. And that they have it as anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred um, towards Jews. So what's important about this is the goal of this definition is to combat Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, more than 37 countries have adapted, adopted this definition including the United States under both President Trump and President Biden. So this is the framework for defining anti-Semitism um, that we're working with um, as well. And you know, a lot of it too is, is not just rhetorical, but also physical manifestations of anti-Semitism, um, which can be directed towards Jewish or non-Jewish individuals. Um, unfortunately, as we're seeing now um, against them individually, but as their property as well towards the Jewish community institutions, as well as religious um, facilities. So this is really the definition we're operating and working off of. And you can see now it's more relevant um, than ever. So um, the next slide. Um, the, also with part of this definition is giving current examples of 
what we're seeing in anti-Semitism. And again, a lot of this was before um, the recent acts, uh, but you could still see very, very relevant for. And what so why this definition is considered the gold standard um, is because it includes all these examples like calling for aiding or justifying the killing or harming um, of Jews, uh, making um, dehumanizing, demonizing, or stereotypical allegations about Jews, um, such as the power of Jews um, collectively, accusing Jews of people being responsible for real or imagined wrongdoing committed by a single Jewish person or single Jewish group, even for acts committed by uh, non-Jews, accusing the Jewish Jews as a people or Israel as a state of intervening or exaggerating um, the Holocaust, and accusing Jewish citizens of being more loyal to Israel or to the alleged priorities of Jews worldwide than the interests of whatever nation they live in. So um, to the next slide. Thanks. So again, before um, the heinous acts in October in Israel, we started seeing an increase in anti-Semitism, um, unfortunately. And in 2022, the, the ADL released its annual audit of anti-Semitic incidents. And in there, they found a total of 3,697 anti-Semitic incidents were reported. And that unfortunately was a 36% increase um, from the year before. And at the time, that was the highest number of uh, anti-Semitic incidents um, being tracked. So um, ADL has found since Hamas's attack uh, on Israel that obviously a lot, a big increase in anti-Semitism and early numbers in like, you know, as of October 25th, and, and geez, look how much has changed um, since then, has showed reported incidents of harassment, um, vandalism, and assault increased 388% from the year um, before that as well. And um, 190 of those, which were directly linked to the war um, in Israel, between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. And 64 per, um, reported incidents during the same time period last year, only four of those were related to Israel. So you could see it's really tying in directly um, to the current events. And the FBI released um, some stats regarding hate crimes for 2022. And it found there that the number of anti-Jewish hate crimes in 2022 had jumped 37% from the previous year, reaching over 1,100 uh, incidents. Additionally, um, the FBI director, Christopher Ray, he testified um, on Halloween, October 31st, and basically was very blunt in saying Jewish American population is only 2%, 2.5% of the American public, but they account for over 60% of all religiously motivated um, hate crimes. And, you know, again, what, you know, taking a step back just on the broad perceptions of Jews within the United States, ADL had some damning statistics as well, where 85% of Americans believe that at least one anti-Jewish trope um, had been subject to at least one anti-Jewish trope compared to 61% in 2019. And 20% of Americans believe six or more uh, anti-Jewish tropes compared to the 2019, 11%. And over 20% support for several statements relating to Jews have too much power, which we'll talk about in a little bit in business. So you could just see, you know, even in these surveys done, seeing just a lot of these um, incidents of anti-Semitism or some of these tropes being um, directed at Jewish individuals. But let's take it to the, the workplace now. And this is where it's um, extremely um, disturbing. And in November of 2022, so this time last year, again, we're in a far different um, environment sitting here in November, 2023. Um, Resume Builder served, um, surveyed over 1,100 hiring managers and recruiters about their views of Jewish individuals and the per perception of the presence of anti-Semitism in the workplace. Their findings were just unbelievably staggering, where 26% of hiring managers say they were less likely to move forward with Jewish applicants. When asked the reasons why, they said Jews have too much power and control. Jews claim to be the chosen people and Jews have too much wealth. So um, that is a very, very disturbing study that was done within the workplace, not only within the workplace, 
but hiring managers as well. And if we go to the next slide, some more reasons about um, why hiring managers and recruiters wouldn't hire Jewish individuals. 26% made assumptions about whether the candidate is Jewish based upon their appearance. 23% want fewer Jews in their industry. 17% of leadership has told, were told their hiring managers not to hire Jewish people. And, and then within that 33%, in that same study, 33% said there, there is anti-Semitism in the workplace or in 29% said anti-Semitism was applicable in their um, company as well. And some, some additional surveys, just so you could see the gravity of this issue, again, before everything that is going on now, the American Jewish Committee released its annual State of Anti-Semitism Report uh, for 2022. And again, it found um, that anti-Semitism has increased um, significantly and Jews who were surveyed, um, you know, a quarter of them had experienced some anti-Semitic incident themselves. And, you know, the sad statistic there is 23% avoided publicly wearing or displaying things that might identify them as Jewish. And again, this is um, earlier this year, and we know now um, certainly a lot less people are publicly trying to identify as Jewish because of uh, potential fears. So um, to the next slide. Um, in, in addition to this um, survey going into the workplace, it really it found that 23% of the respondents avoided expressing views on Israel um, in the workplace um, with colleagues and 10% avoided wearing or displaying something that would identify them as Jewish and 10% said they experienced difficulty in taking time off for a Jewish holiday. Okay, so now you, you, you've heard the statistics, you probably didn't um, need to hear it from me. I know a lot of you um, know this or have experienced it yourself, but let's talk about um, anti-Semitism at work. And unfortunately, people don't check their anti-Jewish attitudes at the door when they enter work. So some of the, um, discrimination we see in the workplace related to um, being Jewish is um, discrimination, for instance, uh, being treated unfairly, um, intentionally, um, because you're Jewish, whether you're not being hired, whether you're being fired, um, segregating employees um, by you know, religion here would be an instance, um, harassing employment uh, employees, whether it's by your managers, coworkers, and um, a big one is denial of reasonable accommodations in the workplace because of the religious belief and then retaliation um, because the employee complained of, in our case here, an anti-Semitic um, workplace. So as far as actual anti-Semitism in the workplace, it takes many forms. It can be very, very blatant um, as just saying, you know, directly not hiring somebody because they're Jewish. But where you see it more is just based upon stereotypes, such as tropes or perceptions that, that are unrelated to um, physical appearance of somebody being Jewish. It can be based upon, um, but it can also be based upon an individual's appearance, such as whether it's their physical characteristics, clothing, or you know, certainly religious garb. Um, and it can also be based upon equity, that there's just too many Jews, or Jews have too many uh, too much power within certain industries or within the workplace. And then what we're likely going to see now is the intersectionality between being Jewish and supporting Israel or being Israeli. Um, so as you heard before, the EEOC protects um, workplace discrimination. A lot of the issues we're discussing now with anti-Semitism in the workplace will fall under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which protects the applicants and employees from discrimination based upon their race, color, religion, sex, national origin. Um, so what does that specifically mean within the Title VII context and why um, religious discrimination as a whole is generally a difficult issue is that the definition of religion under Title VII is very, very broad, and it includes all aspects of religious observances and practices as well as beliefs. So it's not just the practices that are mandated by the individual's faith, um, and it can also include religions that are not traditional, such as Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Islamism, Buddhism. And it can also include 
beliefs that are new or in common or not part of a formal church or sect. So that's, you know, it's very important when you're looking at these issues to understand that in that religion, the definition of your religious beliefs is so individual based upon each individual employee's own belief. It just has to be sincerely held. So um, anti-Semitism in the workplace, you know, it, obviously, you know, we're very fact-driven. Employees have to uh, experience it and complain to us, which we'll talk about. But I want to just give you an overview of the different categories where Jewish um, workers can fit into. Um, it can also, in addition to the typical harassment related to um, being of a certain religion. So we all, we see claims on coming under national origin and national origin discrimination. And I want to explain all of these to you. National origin discrimination means discrimination based upon an individual's or their ancestors is or perceived to be from a certain place or has, or is perceived to have physical, cultural, linguistic characteristics of a particular national origin group. So national origin discrimination, and you'll see the theme with a lot of these overlaps with other forms of discrimination, such as race, color, or religious discrimination. And something else when you're thinking about these as well, is that you don't actually have to be of that national origin to be discrimination, to be discriminated against. Why I said um, the perception that you are from a certain national origin can actually lead to discrimination if an action is take based upon that. So um, another type of uh, area where anti-Semitism fits in is race discrimination. And that involves treating someone, an applicant or employee unfavorably because they are of a certain race or because of personal characteristics associated with that race. So for instance, hair texture, skin color, or other certain facial features can fit in that. And then you're gonna also see color right there and that overlaps as well. Um, it, color discrimination involves treating someone unfavorably because of skin color um, or complexions. So um, courts have found that race and national order discrimination under Title VII encompass ethnicity-based discrimination. Um, for example, Title VII prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national or origins in programs or activities receiving um, federal financial assistance as well. So um, that implicates some other laws in some other institutions outside of the employment as, as well. There's also another law we enforce here, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act that prohibits employers from discriminating against applicants um, based upon genetic information. And how does that um, relate to potential um, Jewish individuals in the workplace? Um, certain Jews, Ashkenazi, Eastern Europe or Sephardic are more at risk to particular diseases, um, as you, you all um, likely know. So it would be illegal in that context for an employer not to hire somebody or base questions knowing that they're um, in Ashkenazi Jew to see if they're more susceptible to um, certain genetic diseases, which then they may have to cover under their health plans. So um, let's get now move to the theories of discrimination of how you prove discrimination, getting a little law school lesson here. So a uh, covered, um, so basically disparate treatment is intentionally treating someone um, or intentionally taking an act based upon those um, protected characteristics. So in our context related to the discussion today, very straightforward, firing or not hiring somebody because the person is Jewish, paying somebody less because the person is Jewish or not promoting someone because the employee is is Jewish. So really just blatant um, violation of the law and just saying, here's the, the, the protected characteristic being Jewish. I'm not hiring you. I'm firing you. Pretty straightforward. The next kind of claims where anti-Semitism fits in is segregation. And, you know, under, you know, our definition of what segregation is, is the employer may not limit, segregate, or classify employees or applicants in a way which would deprive or tend to deprive um, them of individual employment opportunities or impact their status as employee because of the protected characteristics. So how do we segregate here examples within um, uh, the Jewish context? So assigning a Jewish employee to a non-customer contact position because of actual or field customer preference. So, you know, we don't want our 
Orthodox Jewish employees interacting with our customers because we don't want the customers to see you know, whatever religious garb they may be wearing. That would be an example of segregating um, there. So instituting a generally applicable policy prohibiting for instance, um, employees from wearing head coverings in customer facing positions and refusing to make any accommodations. So basically saying, you know, when you, you can't wear a uh, yarmulke at work, if you're going to be interacting um, with, with customers um, outside any justification for some sort of health safety um, reason, just saying, you know, we don't want our customers to see you wearing a yarmulke. That would be a example of segregating a group based upon um, religion or forcing or pressuring Jewish employees to attend affinity groups or separate diversity training based upon their perceived race, color, religion, or national origin. Um, so that would, again, be classifying groups of Jewish individuals and forcing them to do something potentially against their um, religion. So the next category of discrimination here that we deal with is about reasonable accommodation. And you know, this is where we would see a lot of claims historically when it came to religious discrimination. Obviously, the events that are going on now um, are a little different, but this is a, a concept under Title VII that requires an employee to provide a reasonable accommodation for an employee's known religious observance beliefs and practices, and the same for applicants, um, unless it imposes an undue hardship. Um, so this is essentially adjusting a work environment um, related to a religious accommodation so the employee can still do their job, but be able to practice their um, religion um, as well. So what is um, the, the standard here? It's, it's changed a little bit significantly within the um, last Supreme Court session. There was actually a unanimous 9-0 opinion prior to the Supreme Court decision. The standard for religious accommodation was different um, than the disability accommodation. Um, and the Supreme Court um, basically said uh, prior to this decision, um, the law was from a prior Supreme Court decision in the 1970s that an employer, if they, if they, if a religious employee asked for an accommodation request and the employer, it was any more than a de minimis standard, um, which basically, you know, in layman's terms, it costs the employer to, to make that accommodation. They wouldn't have to do that. We're under the Americans with Disability Act. You, the employer would have to show some sort of financial harm that they wouldn't be able to afford that accommodation for the disabled worker. So it was a, a standard that a lot of religious advocacy groups were trying to change over a long time. Um, the new standard doesn't go as high as the Americans with Disability Act standard of that, you know, showing that financial harm. It's just put in the broad perspective within that employer's um, own businesses to see if they um, it poses an undue hardship within that organization. So it's more organization um, based, depending on the size, operating costs, the nature of the request, opposed to that more bright line standard under the Americans with Disability Act, but much higher standard now than it was before when it, it was just de minimis. So now that you understand the basics related to what the employer's obligations are, just think now it's um, in 2023, it's higher than it ever was. How does that relate to Jewish employees? So co some common examples of reasonable accommodation for Jewish employees in the workplace is providing a Jewish employee with an exception to the dress code or grooming policy that prohibits, for instance, head coverings or facial hair. So a lot of employers have grooming policies, which are totally lawful for a business need um, under their um, organization and, and how they want to operate their business, but it needs to be able to accommodate now religious workers. So for example, in the Jewish context, it's wearing a yarmulke or seat seat or observing religious prohibition against certain garments, such as not wearing short skirts or adhering to shaving or um, hair length policies such as payas or side locks. Um, the employer would have to accommodate those um, grooming policies. Adjusting a Jewish employee's work schedule so that the employee can observe the Sabbath or religious holiday. Granting a Jewish employee an exemption from the employer's, let's say, a vaccine mandate. Granting an exemption for a portion of mandatory trainings that which would require a Jewish employee to affirm a certain practice or belief that conflicts with the employee's religious belief. Um, or that, so that's really 
in the sense where a lot of what the EEOC has dealt with historically with Jewish employees is a lot of these beard cases, yarmulke cases, CT cases, or garment cases. Um, but obviously that's going to continue to change as new issues arise. So the other type of claim here um, that Jewish employees are susceptible is harassment. So, you know, our laws prohibit harassment based upon any of the protected characteristics such as religion. Um, and you can't, employers cannot allow a hostile work environment to actually, you know, build and rest within that organization. And how that occurs is the, to have a harassment claim, you have to show that you're part of the protected group. So in this point being Jewish, that you're subject to um, unwelcome harassment and that harassment was based upon race, color, sex, religion, and national origin. And the, ha the harassment was um, severe or pervasive. So it's very severe or it's long going. Um, and it altered the terms and conditions of their employment. And I think this is a very important part to take um, into account as we move into this new age of um, issues at the workplace um, with Jewish employees. Um, with everything going on in Israel. So let me give you some very concrete examples of what may arise to a hostile work environment, what employers have a duty to prevent. So using hate words, um, you know, for example, uh, the K word referring to um, G Jewish employees in that um, regard, using hate symbols. And this is obviously one we're starting to see, uh, you know, across the country and across the world, seeing swastikas stickers um, on, painted on walls. Um, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of Jewish employees being subject to what was called um, Zoom bombing, um, circulating conspiracy theories or editorials about the Jews. And again, we saw this during the COVID pandemic that the Jews were originally responsible for COVID-19 and obviously the conspiracy theories that are going on now relating to Jewish power and everything relating to Israel. But this can all, these are all very concrete examples of what can arise to um, uh, harassment. Um, speaking about Jewish control of the media, government finance, you know, there are so many people who believe in the workplace that there can't be anti-Semitism in the workplace because Jewish people um, control all these industries, whether it's Hollywood, whether it's the bank, whether it's government, finance, you know, you see it across the board, but that is still um, workplace um, harassment. And then of course, uh, also, unfortunately, what we're seeing in the news, engaging in actual or threatened violence against um, Jewish uh, people, against Jewish uh, institutions um, as well. Um, so, but it can also be uh, comments that, you know, oh, this person doesn't look Jewish enough, or um, I only want to hire, you know, a, a Jewish lawyer, or only put Jewish accountants on my, on my uh, project because um, that, that's what they're good at. Things like that can also lead to um, harassment in the workplace. Um, as well. So some more examples, using anti-Semitic slurs, um, posting on social media, anti-Semitic caricatures or graphics. Um, those are those um, longstanding, unfortunate graphics with Jewish people with exaggerating um, long noses or having horns or having Jewish uh, individuals with um, having world leaders on strings. Um, Mocking traditional religious attire observance, mocking somebody that they want to leave for Shabbat um, or, and get an accommodation to do so, mocking somebody for wearing a yarmulke at work, mocking an Orthodox Jew for their hats or for their long beards. Um, and then, you know, telling forward jokes about um, Jews. And again, this gets, gets to some of the perceptions. I um, mean, you know, we've seen everything from um, Jewish women being overbearing or you know, which are also misogynistic as well, um, to some of these just longstanding jokes people think that are common. Like you know, another really bad one is like in negotiations and business. Oh, I'm going to Jew you down, right? All of these can lead to um, workplace harassment as well. And then um, privilege to Jews. Uh, you know, a lot of misconceptions that if you're um, Jewish, you're automatically uh, economically successful, you're automatically wealthy, you're automatically uh, in controls. And that's not true. And a lot of this can um, lead to harassment and really um, continuing denying or trivializing the Holocaust as well, questioning the existence, the gravity, or making offensive comparisons to the Holocaust um, can also lead to harassing work environments as well. 
Um, so moving along um, with the um, theory, one theory uh, of employment discrimination is uh, retaliation. And this is when um, somebody engages in a protected um, moving forward with, whether it's an HR complaint, coming to the EEOC, um, testifying, trying to remain on themselves or on behalf of somebody else are related to an unlawful employment discrimination. And then they get retaliated against themselves. So, you know, I go to HR, I say, you know, I feel Jewish. I mean, I, excuse me, I'm Jewish. I, I feel like the company is creating a hostile work environment because it's allowing um, the coworkers to mock me at work because of my yarmulke um, or this, you know, I wasn't promoted because I was Jewish. And then they, they fire you or they lower your salary. Um, so that is generally a classic case of retaliation. But let me get to retaliation that we've seen related to Jewish employees. That's raising concerns about anti-Semitism in the workplace, supporting concerns about anti-Semitism in the workplace, requesting an accommodation, receiving an accommodation, filing a claim at the EEOC, or support, supporting allegations in your own charge or somebody else's lawsuit, and then something an adverse employment action happens to you um, related to participating in that. So that's just a summary of the main claims under the law and how specific um, Jewish-related discrimination plays into it. But we've been dealing with this at the EEOC for some time and really have been a very proactive agency in addressing anti-Semitism in the workplace. In May of 20. Uh, 21, we unanimously approved a resolution condemning at the time recent violence, harassment, and acts of bias against Jewish individuals in the United States. And we go through some of the factors of um, there about our agency, what our mission is, and how it is imperative that we prevent discrimination in the workplace uh, against Jewish individuals within the United States. Um, in May of this year, Again, before everything that occurred um, that has been occurring uh, in Israel, we put out a fact sheet uh, on the next slide. So this is a very easy one page document. You could print it out, you could put it in your workplace. And this raises very uh, awareness not only of anti-Semitism, but what to do if you face anti-Semitism in the workplace. And it, and it gives very concrete examples of accommodations that employers are duty bound under the Americans with Disability Act to provide for Jewish employees. It also goes through some of the theories of discrimination we just discussed in very easy to read quick bullet points and harassment and retaliation as well. And then it links to um, our um, website where employees can then um, get more information about filing charges of discrimination. Um, there's additional resources that the uh, commission is committed to doing to provide to fighting uh, anti-Semitism in the workplace. You know, part of our strategic enforcement plan, which is a document that federal agencies um, do uh, that establish what their enforcement goals are. Um, this includes discrimination, bias, and hate directed against religious minorities, including anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, as part of a priority to address emerging and developing issues. Since October of 2022, we've held more than 40 outreach events, training our field offices around the country on this important issue. We're also working with the Small Business Association to administration to encourage small businesses and employees to report anti-Semitic and other hate crime to proper authorities. But it's not just our agency um, that is dealing with this as well. There's an actual strategy from the White House. And in May, um, President Biden released the U.S. National Strategy to Counter Anti-Semitism. And this strategy outlines a whole of society approach not just government, a whole society approach to tackle anti-Semitism in America. It has over 100 meaningful actions that over two dozen government agencies are going to take this year to um, prevent anti-Semitism anti across the board. Um, and, and look, you know, dealing with everything from you know, in education to all parts of society. Um, and I just want to highlight some of the, the major principles of the U.S. National Strategy to Counter Anti-Semitism has four pillars. The pillar one is to increase awareness and understanding about anti-Semitism, including its threat to America as a whole, and broadening appreciation of Jewish American heritage. 
Number two, to improve safety and security for Jewish communities, to reverse and normalize the normalization of anti-Semitism and counter anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic discrimination. And four, very importantly, to build cross-community solidarity and collective action to counter um, hate. As far as employers, though, it gives best practices um, as well. And these are best practices that the EEOC has also um, considered. And this is really, you know, what the takeaways from all of this is um, to for all employers can be doing this now for their Jewish employees to promote a culture of civility, to speak up unequivocally against anti-Semitism from the top, consider forming voluntary faith-based employee resources groups, to provide clear guidance about inappropriate statements and postings on social media online that may violate um, company policies that may lead towards discrimination. Um, as far as the religious accommodation concern, which again was the, the bulk of religious discrimination claims that we generally had received, is dealing in making sure that all religions have the proper accommodations they need to be able to um, participate in the workforce. And then you know, hopefully what we're seeing and what we'll see is very specific anti-Semitism training initiatives and policies in the workplace, just like corporations have a lot of policies preventing, you know, other types of harm to incorporate that um, into whether it's their DEI programs or otherwise, and also to carefully audit DEI and anti-racism programs and provide enough training in there that, um, some of the assumptions and stereotypes about of Jewish power, privilege, or racial identity or conclusions um, are also included in that as well. You know, I said earlier, color discrimination is a protected characteristics. And, you know, a lot of individuals may not know that if you've been to Israel, the, the different colors of skin colors of Jewish individuals, it, it, it ranges um, widely from very pale to black. And those are all Individ those people are also um, Jews um, as well. And, you know, just kind of the, the making sure that non-Jewish individuals understand the complexity of, you know, the issues that Jewish individuals uh, face across the world. So um, for employees on this, you know, who are now subject to anti-Semitism in, in, in the workplace outside of the religious accommodation, the most important thing and why we're doing this outreach and why we put out that fact sheet is to educate yourself, educate yourself about your rights. And if you are experiencing anti-Semitism in the workplace from a coworker, from your boss or any other forum, you know, you need to feel comfortable to be able to speak up and go to human resources, report the conduct like you would if you were sexually harassed, for instance. You know, it's such a common place to know that you know, employers feel comfortable reporting some certain claims like, you know, I'm being sexually harassed. I'm, I wasn't promoted because I'm a woman. Whatever those longstanding typical HR um, complaints are, employees understand that. But for Jewish employees who, whether it's the you know, perception that Jewish employees are better off. Some of those issues we talked about before were that we don't need to complain. Our people have been through much worse than this. Um, so sort of that, um, maybe some of that guilt that has to be put aside because we can't address these issues if Jewish employees are not complaining against them. And then two, for non-Jewish employees or Jewish employees, if they're a bystander, they have the ability to speak up, to go to HR, um, to, to deal with these issues as well. And again, faith-based resources groups, especially related to Judaism, can really assist having non-Jewish individuals identify and understand some of the very unique issues um, that come with being um, Jewish, especially in this day of age. And um, filing a charge of discrimination, I believe at this point, uh, Mindy is going to go through that process of how, if you feel like you're being discriminated against in the workplace because you're Jewish, or, um, and how it works when it actually comes to the EEOC. Hi, thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm just gonna talk for a few minutes briefly about one option. If you feel that you've been discriminated against, you can come to the EEOC to file a charge of discrimination. We have a lot of information on our website about filing a charge. Um, Monica from um, the EEOC's Washington field office where I work is posting some information on the chat. So 
Um, hopefully there will be some information there if you want links, but it's pretty easy to get to on eeoc.gov. There's a whole section about filing a charge. Um, for the most part, people begin the process of filing a charge online through our website and the public portal that is there. There's information about how to do this, but in brief, you create um, an account, you set up your email address there, you submit an online inquiry, and then that allows you to schedule an, an intake appointment. And based on that intake appointment, we have the opportunity to talk to um, the person about what they're experiencing, explain the law, answer questions, and the individual can decide whether or not they want to file a charge. Um, many offices, most offices, um, are also available for walk-in appointments. Um, and information about what the walk-in hours are can be found on eeoc.gov as well. There are strict time limits to keep in mind um, when it comes to filing a charge of discrimination. And basically, if the charge, if the allegations in the case are covered not only by federal law, by, but also by a state or local law, then you have 300 days. And if they're only covered by federal law, then you have 180 days. In the DC area, most claims would be covered by both federal and state or local law, and therefore it would be a 300 day time period. But there are a few exceptions to that. Um, employers that are not covered by the local law, such as um, the uh, Metro system is not covered by the local law. Uh, certain other entities are not. So for them, it would be 180 and for everybody else, it's 300 days. I should mention there are also, a, you know, state and local agencies in our region um, that can accept charges. So if you're in Prince William County or Alexandria um, and you'd rather start with the local agency or the state of Maryland agency, that is an option as well. And all of them have their own time limits and processes. But um, to find out more about filing a charge with the EEOC, as I said, go to our website, lots of information there. So let me talk now for a moment um, on the next slide about what will happen. Okay, so once a charge is filed, we will send a copy of the charge to the employer. And that's supposed to happen and does happen within 10 days of the time that a charge is filed. And in most cases, we offer both parties, the person who filed the charge and the employer, the opportunity to sit down with each other through our mediation program and try to resolve the case. Um, so we offer mediation right up front in most cases before the employer spent too much money um, responding to the charge, before views are hardened any further and try to see if we can facilitate a resolution of, of the charge. It's an extremely successful program when both parties say yes, and it is voluntary. If both parties say yes, um, and they we have a mediation, 70%, maybe more of the charges that go through mediation are resolved right there. If it isn't resolved in mediation, then, or it doesn't go to mediation at all for some reason, then typically we serve that charge, as I said, and the employer would submit a response to the charge called a position statement. And they typically attach other documents, like in a harassment case, for example, they might say, you know, this didn't happen and they didn't follow the policy and here's our policy. So I'll give you a copy of it, EEOC, so you can see, you know, what, what the policy required. So they would typically submit a position statement, maybe attachments and exhibits, and that information to the extent it's not confidential would we would normally then share with the person who filed the charge who then get also gets an opportunity to respond and submit some sort of um, rebuttal if they want to the information that the employer provided then EEOC may conduct additional investigation we may interview witnesses we may obtain additional documentation or data from the employer we may you know, there, there's a wide range. Obviously, it depends on what the particular facts in a given case are. And ultimately, along this route, we may settle the case, even if it didn't resolve in our mediation program, it may resolve later on. A few, it, sometimes even it goes back to mediation later. Um, if we find that um, we're unable to um, conclude 
based on what we have, that there's um, evidence of a violation, we, we may um, decide along the path um, of an investigation to dismiss the case, in which case the individual gets notice of rights and they can file a lawsuit in court if they want to within 90 days of when they receive that notice. If, however, we find it's more likely than not that there was discrimination in a case, then we engage in a process called conciliation where we try again to get the parties together. We're now very involved in it and trying to come up with a re resolution that we think would provide appropriate relief to the person who we, we found was a um, was subjected to discrimination and also the kind of relief that hopefully would prevent future discrimination from occurring. And if all that happens and we're unable to resolve it, then our legal department may consider the case um, and recommend possible litigation, um, which we would then file in federal court. Okay, so that is sort of a overview of um, what happens. And um, Vicki, well, maybe I'll turn this back to you to see where we go from here. Great, thank you so much. Um, that was a lot of information. I know one of the questions that's been circulating is, um, can these slides be made available? Um, and I know that, that I think you guys have to look back with your, within the department to see if that is okay, but the, we are recording this um, this webinar, so we will be distributing that recording and people can certainly listen again um, to get any of the details. Um, before I get to the questions that are in the Q&A, one question I have for you, Mindy, um, you were just saying 70% of people who agree to mediation, they, they are successful. I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of sort of what what comes out of those um, mediations? You know, in, in my mind, I wonder, does it does it come down to misunderstandings? People didn't understand that something that they were doing was anti-Semitic or is there some other story behind that? Um, I think a lot of the, the cases and this, that statistic isn't limited to religion charges or any particular kind of charge, but I think a lot of the times what what is very helpful is to have a neutral third party, the mediator, sit down with people and try to come to some sort of resolution. Um, and they may not have really had a, a third party, you know, somebody neutral who could help facilitate that conversation. So um, the relief may, you know, typically ha involve some sort of monetary relief, but sometimes does not. Sometimes it is um, a change in a policy or a practice like saying, okay, I get it. I didn't understand why you needed, for, say, in a religious discrimination case, you know, the um, accommodation of being allowed to wear something on your head when we have a no um, head coverings policy, right? And people can sort of sit down and talk about it and understand each other a little bit better and then change can be made. Um, sometimes it's an apology. Sometimes it's training. Sometimes um, it's training for the manager who maybe made a mistake or did something wrong. Sometimes it's training for the employee who brought the claim saying, I feel like I'm not getting the opportunities. And if I could get training, you know, I would be able to advance. So there's a huge range of possibilities. Um, and sometimes just having a neutral person early on sit down and say, how can we work this out can be extremely beneficial on both sides. Great. Um, so one of the questions in the chat asks about indirect um, discrimination. Um, it, they referenced that in their workplace, there was sort of a talking listening session after October 7th. Um, and somebody in the group said, made the comment that Israel created Hamas. Somebody else said October 7th is over, let's move on. Um, things like that that are perhaps more indirect. Can you, either of you give some guidance on how a Jewish employee sitting in that kind of a listening session can respond? Um, I think it's very tough from an employer's perspective um, because, you know, for the Jewish employee, it is important to make sure that their employer knows that um, that is creating, you know, a hostile work environment. It has to fit neatly within one of 
our protected areas, right? So it gets very difficult between employee speech and generally in the private sector, employees don't have First Amendment um, rights um, and wh what it means to them individually and then what duty their employer, once they're on notice, has to not further that hostile work environment directed towards them based upon their religion and based upon their national origin. And I think that's where the line is blurring here when it comes to anti-Semitism in the workplace now is that it's blurring between national origin. Are you Israeli or are you, you know, Jewish as a religion? And where are those comments being directed to where you could see it can be um, a combination of all of those. But in those situations, if an employee, if a Jewish employee is hearing from a coworker that, you know, move on or whatever, this didn't happen or whatever the conspiracy theories are, is that then that coworker goes to their human resources department and says, you know, and says that this is creating a hostile work environment to me, for me, that there's certain elements that they would have to prove in there that we went over, whether it's severe enough or it's consistent. The employer has some duty at that point to look at it, to address it, and, and to remediate it if possible for that individual um, um, Jewish worker. And the more, you know, it goes back to what we we're saying before, the more that employees, Jewish employees are vocal to their HR departments, that this behavior is unacceptable and shouldn't be within the workplace, the more the employer has a duty to stop that potential harassing behavior to go give like we said in the best practices, some of those statements that this is not going to be tolerated or just not going to be discussed within our workplace. So I think the, the core of it is the employees being able to, to um, voice their concerns to HR without the fear of retaliation, very, you know, based upon those. And then the employers can set policies, you know, limiting it or completely um, addressing that specific issue. Mindy, do you have anything to add to that? Thanks. So. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, I, I think what I'm hearing is not that you need to stay silent in the face of it, but the real path from the employment rights perspective is the HR department. That that if these if if you're hearing these things, let the HR department know that it's making you uncomfortable, that it's being said, and just push in that direction rather than engaging in a political debate in the workplace. Based upon, maybe political is the wrong word, but rather than engaging in the in the in the debate. Yeah, but it's it's also it needs to be based upon, you know, I feel this way because of my religion. I feel mm -hmm. this way because of my national origin. Um, and does it then lead to a hostile work environment? Does it actually lead to a claim you can come to EEOC? That's a different perspective, but you mm -hmm. can't even get there without essentially putting your employer on notice that this type of um, actions within the workplace is, you know, offensive to your religion. Um, and potentially creating that or your national origin, creating that a uh, hostile work environment. And then that at least allows the employer to essentially get involved and then make the practices of saying that if we're going to talk about it, we're going to hear both sides, or we're just not going to talk about it in the workplace because it has nothing to do with our business, with our business as well. So again, that doesn't start until the employer has noticed. Now, mm -hmm. if the employer has noticed and doesn't do anything, that's a whole different story. And you, you see why these cases are hard, while the hypotheticals are hard, because it's all based upon that individual's own belief. So you may have one Jewish employee who this may not be offensive to them at all, mm -hmm. um, or may take an opposite position. Um, and so it's it's so individualized on, and that's what we look at. That did it create that work that hostile work environment? Was it harassing to that individual employee based upon their own sincerely held religious beliefs? So you can see why these cases are get very complicated. So I'll just chime in briefly um, to echo a lot of um, what the commissioner said, and we we do say in various um, guidance documents on our website that you know. It's, it's a very individual circumstances and the time right now is very fraught and emotional for a, a lot of people, understandably. And one thing to consider is to, if, is to say to the person who said something that offended you, like, hey, I, I didn't really feel comfortable with that. Maybe we shouldn't talk about religion or politics at work. Um, I think it's a matter of if you feel safe doing that, if you feel comfortable, if this is a person you've, you have a relationship with, et cetera. So it's just one thing to consider. There may be a way to say, whoa, let's keep lunch to sports from the weekend. You know, there, there's sometimes there are ways to diffuse and 
move on. Um, it, it's not always a good idea and it doesn't always work, but just to say that is a possibility. And the only other thing I would add is it's important to look at what the employer's harassment policy is. I mean, I definitely agree reporting to the supervisor, Vicki, as you pointed out, may very well be the right path. And that may be what the harassment policy, if they're assuming there is one, provides for, or contacting HR, as you said. Sometimes there are other options. Sometimes there's a second level manager who you feel more aligned with or a, another manager. Sometimes there's a hotline. Sometimes, you know, we can't predict it all is what I'm saying. So I would suggest that people, if you're in this situation, go look up the policy and look up the procedure um, and see what your options may be. There may be more than one. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so kind of on that blurring of lines, um, there's a question about um, social media and online um, comments. Um, can you talk about the difference between online that is utilizing the, the, the platform of the employer versus an employee who's using personal um, social media or other online mechanisms? This is also a very tricky area. It's it's one you deal with in other contexts as well. This is nothing new. And employee, you know, about employees using it. <laughs> obviously, if it's on their workplace um, computers, uh, employees have very little to no rights regarding what they're posting in their workplace form and can be immediately fired um, for any of that. When it comes to their own personal social media, again, to Minnie's point, companies have workplace uh, pol conduct policies that may uh, include some of their personal um, social media when it comes to work um, related events or just code of conducts that they want their that they hold their employees standard to in and out of the workplace and you know the whole concept of you know your first amendment rights and free speech well you know again it's, it's very tricky when you work uh, for an employer that is not uh, the federal government and generally you have very limited rights so you know historically um, forget what's been going on recently. If an employee does something egregious on their social media or before social media in public gets arrested or commits a crime, the employer is within their rights, uh, I, you know, with a lot of exceptions related to a collective bargaining agreement or otherwise or employment contracts to terminate that employee under the at will employment doctrine. So, um, Again, it's really you know, a conversation that we're seeing now. We saw it a lot um, with the Black Lives Matter movement and other social justice movements. At what point um, can you bring that speech into work and what point does it become um, hostile to other employees uh, in the co work context side? But generally, you know, the broad code of conducts can allow employers uh, who employees who are at will to terminate employees um, for things that they're doing outside of work that may implicate work, that may impact the ability of that organization um, to thrive, to sell. And that's what obviously you're seeing a lot uh, in the news. And that doesn't really implicate EEO um, law. It doesn't implicate us unless you're going to be applying those policies differently. And I think that's really important takeaway from all this. If you are saying that, if you're firing all the employees who um, who support you know, one issue over another issue, I'm not talking about the, the current issue, um, that, you know, it may have a breakdown between certain religions, national origins, right? So if you're only going to fire, in this case, uh, Muslim employees, but you're not in firing Jewish employees who are can, in that same exact conduct, now that is very gray and open for um, debate and discussion, right? We're essentially saying maybe committing a crime by uh, uh, vandalizing somebody's property. Um, those policies also need to be um, enforced equally and not on the basis of religion, not on the basis of national origin. And that's where some of the, the trickiness may occur in this. Um, so one real quick question, which I think I know the answer to, but if, if the employer's employee relations department dismisses the claim, can the person still go to the EEOC? I would think that that's exactly when the person would go to the EEOC. Am I right about that? Mindy, I'll let you take this one. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, so there's no requirement that you go do anything before you come to EEOC. Um, so it's just that, as the commissioner described, um, ultimately, for an employer to be held responsible for 
harassment, they they kind of have to know about it. So either they're the ones like the CEO or somebody is the one engaging in it or um, they observe it. They were at the event or in the lunchroom or whatever, or somebody reports it to them. So that's what part of why we encourage people to report it. And, and it gives the employer the opportunity to correct it. But there isn't like a law or something that says you have to go report it to your human resources or employee relations department. It just may impact whether the employer can stop it and whether they would ultimately be held liable for it if you decided to pursue action against them. But in, there is so much information on our website, eoc.gov, about harassment. If you go to our main page and you click on um, the employee part, there's a section there on harassment. There is a whole section on religious discrimination and a guidance on religious discrimination that includes a discussion of harassment. Many of these principles are sort of out there. And I think if you're facing this, I, I would suggest looking at some of these materials. You can contact us. I'm sure Monica from my office can post her contact information in the chat. Um, we will try to direct you to resources, explain what the law is. There's a lot to think about and just process, I think, if you're in a situation like that. So we want to try to provide information, whether it's at our intake process or in a conversation you know, with Monica or through um, all the information we have on our website to help you sort through options and what your rights are. Can you speak a little bit to what the role of bystanders is? Um, there's a question about somebody who's not Jewish being offended by anti-Semitism that they're hearing. Do they have a role in reporting to HR? Do they have any recourse? So, um, you know, this is a, this is an interesting question. We, we do a training, um, call, uh, that's on respectful workplace for employers. Um, and a key part of that in in teaching employers how to have a workplace that is respectful and doesn't allow harassment to start or thrive, um, the role of allies is a is an aspect of that that's pretty important. And so um, creating a situation where employees feel free to complain about discrimination in the workplace, whether it's affecting them directly or their coworkers, um, is a really valuable thing for employers to do. So I guess I would say allies can be a very important part of the effort to make sure that if there are inappropriate remarks, things that would lead, you know, give rise to a harassment claim that they can be there to support coworkers and they can report it for sure. And I, I just wanna echo something the commissioner said about retaliation. If you are part, if you are the person who reports it, um, whether you are the intended target of, you know, anti-Semitic remarks, for example, or not, um, you are protected from retaliation. So obviously, hopefully no one would be subjected to that, but anyone who goes forward and cooperates in an investigation internally with the EEOC, brings forth comments, serves as a witness in an investigation that the employer or EEOC conducts obviously should not be punished because they came forward. Great. Um... So there's a question here about um, like specific citations. Am I, am I, can we find specific citations to cases related to anti-Semitism on the website? Yeah, all of our cases, you can search all of our press releases for cases that we filed litigations and cases we settled either through our conciliation process. Sometimes they post the um, results there or our um, victories within federal court. You could type in um, Jewish, you could type in that, but I can, I can tell you a lot of those cases are going to be based upon not accommodating Jewish workers within the workplace. And, and Mindy, you know, let me know in your experience, if you've, the vast majority of those cases before now really had been related to, and religion cases generally, just related to the employer not 
properly accommodating an employee's need for religious accommodation. So you'll see Sabbath cases, you'll see yarmulke cases, you'll see beard cases or religious garb cases. I don't know if you'll see cases as direct as saying, you know, we're firing you because you're from Israel or you're firing you because um, you're Jewish. But uh, Mindy, you may have seen otherwise in your time. No, no, I agree with that. Um, you know, we we don't um, receive a lot of charges, um, haven't in the past. Um, and the, probably from, I, you know, from my own experience, most of them are accommodation cases, like the commissioner said. Um, there are several cases like that, including a couple in the last few years filed by out of our Maryland office. Um, involving failure to accommodate somebody who wanted off for Rosh Hashanah, I think, and articulated that as he was in the hiring process. And then I think the offer was withdrawn. And um, another case that was, I can't remember if it was in Maryland or Florida, involving a maybe a beard situation. Um, there are a couple, but, but not a lot on... Um, anti-Semitic remarks, harassment. There was a case, I think this one is out of Maryland, um, against a company called Administaff that involved pretty egregious harassment. But just so that you understand, we get 60, 70, 80, whatever thousand charges a year. And we file 100, 200, 200, something like that lawsuits a year. And the um, it is only the lawsuits and the occasional public resolution, very, not so common, um, that would be posted publicly. But um, so it's not like there's going to be a ton out there. The vast majority of the cases we resolve in the administrative process, and it it is not a public resolution. But I did mention we have this religious discrimination guidance that you can find on our website for employees, go to religion, policy and guidance, it's there. Um, and Monica may have posted it um, in the chat or the Q&A, but there is a ton of case law cited in those documents. So they're not all EEOC cases, they're just cases. And, you know, it gives you an idea of what the case law is and what the EEOC's position is um, on, on many, many issues. Great, that's helpful. Um, we am cognizant of the time. We've got probably five or 10 more minutes um, left. So I have a couple of kind of big-ish questions that I'm going to propose them both to you and uh, and let you fill that time <laughs> with whichever one makes, you know, however it makes sense. Um, but one is sort of, the, I think, a big question that we're dealing with in a lot of venues right now, which is the concept of hate speech versus free speech or hate speech is free speech. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that fits into the work environment? Um, and then the second one is if you could talk a little bit about how do you evaluate harassment or incidents of anti-Semitism under the threshold for hostile work environment claims and just give a little bit more meat to that conversation. Well, I'll let me handle the second question. The first question, which is tough, it really, because you know this whole speech at work is again, is not constitutionally um, protected. It's so much on the employer setting the policy and tone of um, the, their workforce and preventing these um, harassment claims or hostile work environment claims from ever coming, from really putting clear guidelines on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable at work, you know, for all types of speech. And I think that's what we need employers to start doing. So if it does, you know, rise to the point where it is considered, hate speech or harassing speech within that workplace before even getting to, you know, what is getting to the level of creating a hostile work environment is that that's violating company policies. And that allows individuals to go to HR departments or go to their managers within the framework that organization set and say, you know, this is, this employee is violating company policies, whether or not it's really leading to a hostile work environment for that claim for that individual is one thing. And that allows then the employer um, if to then, discipline that employee or fire that employee for violating basically their policies and procedures that employer set forward. And we started to see that, you know, during COVID time when there's a lot of discussion and, and post George Floyd, um, a lot of those social issues coming into the workplace where some employers took a very hard stand and saying, you're here to work. 
You're not here to discuss, you know, political or social issues, and that's going to violate our company policies. And we don't care what issue you're talking about. This is not appropriate for the workplace, which is different than, you know, the laws we enforce um, that lead to an actual claim of discrimination, which which it may at that point. So I think you got to just separate. It's, it's more of a company culture thing of what the tolerance is of having these sort of discussions, um, whether it furthers the business or it's a distraction in the workplace. But outside of our, that part question is a little outside of our world until, unless it leads to employee complaining that it's creating a hostile work environment, they can meet those elements. And the employer doesn't do anything to remediate it. Maybe um, do you need me to repeat the other question? I think it was how, how, how do you show a hostile work environment or what would we look at to assess that? Yep. Okay. So um, every, as you can imagine, every case is unique, um, has its own set of circumstances and we, they're extremely fact specific. So we're going to try to talk to the person usually right at the intake stage and ask them to tell their story of what happened. Learn who said what, who did what, when did it happen, that sort of thing. It's very important um, for the person coming forward to EOC, if you can, to have notes of what happened when, who said what. It's nice, write it down, put it in your phone, put it on a you know notepad you carry around, take a picture. There's a swastika in the restroom, why don't you take a picture of that? Um, so we will gather information about what happened. Um, and we are assessing whether it rises to the level of a hostile work environment. Generally, one or two incidents is not enough. Um, but, and, and we don't have like a magic number, but unless it is very egregious, um, then usually one or two things or three or whatever it may be, a small number would not rise to the level of a hostile working environment. That doesn't mean you shouldn't come forward and follow the company policy, go to the supervisor, HR, whatever it is, because sometimes, as I said, an employer can try to stop it before it would rise to the level of a hostile work environment, which is really the best thing. So anyway, we're looking at all the circumstances, what what information, sometimes there are no witnesses, there's nothing physical. So I'm, you know, I'm not saying you have to have pictures and um, other people, but if you do, you know, collect that, pull that together as it's happening so that you can present it to us. Um, we would then consider um, what, what additional evidence we may need. As I said, the employer submits a response to the charge. They may say that never happened, or we don't know if that happened because nobody ever told us about it. So then we might go back to the person who filed the charge and say, hey, did you tell anybody about this? And then they say, yes, and here's the email I sent. You know, So this is the kind of thing we're looking at, the very kinds of things we've been talking about today. What happened, um, when, who, what, et cetera. Um, and did you report it and who else saw it? And we may end up interviewing witnesses, coworkers. We may interview the alleged harasser. We may talk to the supervisor, HR people. We're going to want to see the employer's policy if they have one, their um, procedure for reporting harassment claims. Um, and that's, that's basically what our investigation would look like. We're trying to assess if it's um, a severe or pervasive harassment. Um, if the person complained, who the harasser was, etc. Thank you. Um, last question, I think, is um, straightforward enough that I can ask it in the short time we have left. Um, has the number of EEOC complaints alleging discrimination against Jews risen over the last year? Well, it's an easy one to answer is that we don't know. Um, as you heard from Indy, employees generally have 300 days to file a charge of discrimination. And the bigger issue is when they file a charge of discrimination, there's not a box that says it's because of anti-Semitism. It's a box that says religion. And it mm -hmm. takes us to go through those and um, figure out whether it was based upon what religion it was whether it was based upon recent events, whether it was based upon just not being able to wear a yarmulke at work. So it takes a lot of time. So it really, um, it's gonna be hard for us to answer that question mm -hmm. um, 
maybe for a year or two. I mean, you know, for the big question was how did COVID impact the workforce? And we weren't able to really release those statistics until this year. So you could see it's just the lag on how the process works. Um, it's not an immediate answer we can give. Makes sense. Makes sense. Thanks so much. Um, all right. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us um, and your team. Um, I, I hope I want to thank everybody else who who's attended um, and asked questions. Um, it's uh, important information. Um, I want to also impress upon everybody that the JCRC is also um, a resource for for you as you're navigating. Um, taking in this information. If you're having a problem at work, we can also be a resource to talk you through, um, you know, what 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 steps to take and and when when to reach out to the EOC when uh, things like that. Um, not experts on on the employment aspect of it, but certainly a resource to um, to help you navigate the resources that you have. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, it's a busy time. I hope to see a lot of you on the mall tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and thank you for being here.